Hey everyone, uh, today's video is going to be another presentation. I haven't made one of these in a while. This time it's going to be a sort of higher level overview talking about like forensics, encoding, encryption, and and uh, that sort of stuff. This presentation I actually made quite a few months ago, so uh, the material isn't 100% fresh with me. I do have a lot of links in the presentation that I will also drop in the description below. So if you want to read some of these articles on your own or some of these blogs, then you can go ahead and look into that. Uh, I also have a lot of text in this presentation, so uh, you should go ahead and watch this video in 1080p. I'm recording it in very high quality, so you can go ahead and follow along that way. Anyways, first slide, encoding. So one thing I want to be very clear about uh, at the start of this is the language. When people are talking about encoding or encryption, these words are not interchangeable, and I think to the you know untrained eye or uh, someone who just sort of hears these words casually thrown around they might think that they're the same thing but in fact they're quite different so the purpose of encoding is to transform data so that it can be easily uh, or properly and safely consumed by a different type of system an example would be binary data being sent over email or viewing special characters on a web page the goal isn't to keep this information secret, but rather to ensure that it's able to be properly consumed. And encoding transforms data into another format using a scheme that is publicly available, so it can be easily reversed. It doesn't require a key, as the only thing required to decode it is an algorithm that is used to encode it. Examples of this include ASCII, Unicode URL encoding, and Base64. I actually went ahead and grabbed this description from the blog that you can see down below. Daniel Missler, uh, not 100% sure how to pronounce that, but he had a really great article where I got quite a bit of this information from. And uh, yeah, so that's encoding. Remember that the, the idea here is that we're not trying to send a secret message, it's just so that two systems can effectively communicate to each other using a predetermined format that is publicly available. So it is no secret how a regular message in plain text, a message that you would be able to read as a human, becomes something like we're going to see in the next slide. Or in a couple slides, I take that back. Uh, encryption. The purpose of encryption is to transform data in order to keep it secret from others. An example is sending someone a secret letter that only they should be able to read or securely setting a password over the internet. Rather than focusing on usability, the goal is to ensure that the data cannot be consumed by anyone other than the intended recipient or recipients. Encryption transforms data into another format in such a way that only specific individuals or an individual can reverse the transformation. It uses a key which is kept secret in conjunction with the plain text, the original message, and the algorithm in order to perform the encryption operation. As such, the ciphertext, algorithm, and key are all required to return to plain text. Examples of this are AES, Blowfish, or RSA. Once again, credit uh, down below. I will link that article in the description of this video. Now, a summary. Encoding is for maintaining data usability and can be reversed by employing the same algorithm that uh, encoded content, so no key is used. And encryption is for maintaining data confidentiality and requires that the use of a key, which is kept secret, in order to return to plain text. Uh, two other things that I'm just going to quickly touch on are hashing and obfuscation. Not going to dive into these in this specific video, but just so you know, hashing is used for validating the integrity of content by detecting all modification thereof via obvious changes to the hash output. So you might have heard of an MD5 hash before, or you might have had to download a file, and then below the file download link, you'll see an MD5 hash so that when you download it, you can verify the integrity of that specific file. And then obfuscation is used to prevent people from understanding the meaning of something. And it's often used with computer code to help prevent successful reverse engineering and or the theft of a product's functionality. So obfuscation, you might have heard outside of the realm of technology because it's not sort of limited just to this one facet here. It's when you're sort of uh, making something unclear. Once again, like the, the key point here is preventing people from understanding the meaning of something. So oftentimes, oftentimes uh, 
programs or software will obfuscate their code so that people can't really steal it or dive into what the function of it is. Uh, so let's move on to some examples of these. Now some common encoding methods are Base64, Binary, UTF-8, and Hex. So in the examples here for Base64, if you put that in an online converter, the word example becomes RxHHBXBSZQ equals equals. A common way to tell when something is encoded in Base64 is when it has that double equal sign at the end. Though you can of course still just backspace the double equal sign and if you decode it, you'll get the same result. So either way, oftentimes when I personally see that sort of mix of uppercase and lowercase letters like that, my mind first goes to base64. Next is binary, which is a little bit more common. People have definitely at least heard of it or seen it, and you know, maybe in more of like a goofy thing on TV where you're just seeing zeros and ones fly by on someone's computer screen. Uh, but when you encode the word test in binary, it becomes that big long string of zeros and ones. And one thing to note about binary is that each group of eight characters represents one letter. So if you were to count it out, the first eight characters in this string represent the letter T, the next eight represent the letter E, the next eight represent the letter S, and the last eight would represent the letter T. And if you go ahead and count it out, you would probably end up seeing that T and T are the same, though I do take that back because it's a capital letter. So, my bad. <laughs> uh, UTF-8, uh, snake becomes uh, this backslash X53, XS6E, and so on and so forth. And then hex, another common one. Uh, lots of the time you'll see hex value used use with like uh, coloring and that sort of stuff. The word pliskin becomes 50, 6C, 69, 73, 73, 6B, 656E. Once again, noting that 7373 73 represent the two S's, so whenever you see a duplicate letter, it's going to be represented by the same hex uh, group of characters. Now, common encryption algorithms are triple DES or 3DES as it's more commonly abbreviated. So if you take the word triple with a key of DES, I just kind of spelt it out for the key, it becomes 0C22F197 blah blah blah. And it looks like hex, but if you actually were to take this string and put it in a hex decoder online, you would get this big mess of really nothing and that's not going to help you. Uh, so you would need the key and the uh, the cipher text here in order to derive what the original plain text was. And RSA, uh, the word trial becomes, and then this big mess here that you see. Uh, and you can use this website uh, for the RSA encryption. Uh, like I said, made this presentation quite a few months ago, so I don't exactly remember. Uh, what these links are for, but they will be down below if you want to go ahead and try it out uh, for yourself. Uh, AES-256, this one's commonly associated with things like home Wi-Fi. If you've ever set up your own Wi-Fi password on your little uh, router or modem that doubles as a router that ISPs are doing these days, then you could uh, set your uh, like private key or whatever so that the people inside your home network have to enter the SSD, the name of the uh, router's wireless broadcast, and then the password to authenticate. And those use uh, AES encryption, typically. Uh, so yeah, a typical, you're usually going to see it say like um, AES like Enterprise or uh, AES Home, I believe. And that just, I believe, only varies in if it's AES 128 or 256. So one being a little stronger than the other. So bone with a key of saw becomes JX, TY, 0, or O, JC, blah, 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 blah. And XOR, uh, which is usually associated with uh, with like things like viruses or Trojans. Oftentimes viruses are going to try to 
encrypt themselves to tr hide themselves from the from an antivirus they use try to use little clever methods like that and XOR is one of those more common ones that is associated with that sort of thing um, you might hear people call it ZOR or that something is XORed or things like that it's often spoken or abbreviated in sort of weird weird ways like that uh, so yeah Trojan with the key of horse becomes 2829292543 and XOR is actually pretty interesting uh, in the future if I think of it I might make a completely separate video on that because uh, it's a it's cool and uh, there's you can talk about the math behind it and uh, if you want to do a bit of research on it or any of these really the math behind it and the logic is quite interesting so next thing uh, speaking of ciphers kind of mentioned them a few times in cryptography a cipher or sometimes spelled cipher with a Y is an algorithm for performing encryption or decryption it's a series of well-defined steps that can be followed as a procedure so some definitions of ciphers include a cryptographic system in which units of text of regular length usually letters are transposed or substituted according to a predetermined code B is the key to such a system described in A and C is a message written or transmitted in such a system so let's go ahead and dive into a few examples of ciphers uh, ROT13 so if you take the text this is an example and you ROT13 it it becomes G U V F V F N A R K N Z C Y R. Uh, ROT13 basically is just a shift in the alphabet. So if you were to take T and count 13 letters after T, <clears throat> you'd hit the end of the alphabet and obviously you'd start back at the beginning and then you'd end up hitting G. So you notice that uh, there, while well, there is no T's, <laughs> so I can't use that as an example, but let's look at the letter S see how right here there's a letter S and then another letter S right there well in our cipher text it is instead replaced with a V so uh, let's use something a little bit uh, easier here so A what comes 13 letters after A A B C D E F G H I J K L N okay so A becomes N and or A becomes N and then A or pardon me, N becomes A. So you see how you're just swapping halfway through the alphabet? Uh, now, a Caesar shift or Caesarian shift is the exact same as ROT13, except you choose the amount of letters you're shifting by. So this is an example with a shift of two letters becomes VJKUKUCPGZCORNG. So what's two letters after A? C. So you can see there. A becomes C, N becomes P, and so on and so forth. So if you wanted to, you could do a Caesar shift of 16, and whatever comes 16 letters after A, that's what you'd replace it with. Uh, a substitution cipher, which I spelt wrong, is when you choose the key yourself. Instead of specifically shifting, the entire alphabet by 15 characters you choose which letter becomes what new letter so I would say to myself okay every A in the actual message is actually gonna be a B and every B is gonna be a G and every C is gonna be Z until you go through the whole alphabet and you've sort of redefined the alphabet so typically when you're talking about a substitution cipher you don't write like a huge grid of A becomes this, B becomes that. Instead, you end up with a key, which is your new alphabet. So instead of your alphabet being A, B, C, D, E, F, G, it's whatever you want. So P, P, H, Q, G, I, U, and that's the new order of my alphabet, uh, if you sort of get that example. And here, the plain text is Hannah's home has heat, hopefully. Oftentimes, what you can do with substitution ciphers or what uh, tools that exist out there that are used to help crack a substitution cipher, they'll monitor or try to pick up on the patterns in the text. So, 
For instance, in our first word here, Hannah, how many English letters have, or English words, have the same two letters repeating in the middle, and the two letters on the outside of that have the same repeating letter, and the two letters on the outside of that are the same repeating letter. So there's not that many six-letter words that are spelt the same forward and backward like Hannah is in this case. So if you were to take a guess that this was Hannah, and then there was an apostrophe after this, you could almost certainly say, well, it's probably going to be Hannah's. You wouldn't say it's going to be Hanpa or Hanapa, because that's not a thing. Uh, so then immediately you would know that every E in my encoded message is an H, and every R is an S, and then you could slowly start replacing it. And then by using other uh, common methods of observing the English language and the way that letters repeat, like the most common letters like T and E, uh, by sort of viewing the patterns and the occurrence of letters, you can uh, make an educated guess on the ciphertext and what the actual, the difference between the ciphertext and the outcome. Uh, hopefully I explain that well enough. Uh, but substitution ciphers, not very complicated. So if you want to dive deeper into this, or if you have more questions, always feel free to drop me a comment and I'll get back to it as soon as I can, if I have more to say on it. And a uh, vignette cipher, vignette, I don't know 100% how to say that, but uh, you would have the word Spider-Man with a passphrase of vignette to become N-X-O-Q-I-I-Q-V-V. -I -I and uh, once again, just another cipher uh, not one I'm personally too familiar with, though it is one of the more common ones. If you start doing research into ciphers, you would most definitely stumble upon it. Uh, go ahead and look a couple of these up. Uh, they're pretty interesting. Like I said, I might make videos in the future on specific ones, or ones that I personally have an interest in, because there's a couple that I've somehow managed to you know, to spend an hour reading online about one specific one and how it works, because the thing about ciphers is some of them have been around for over a hundred years, and if you wanted to, you could still use them to this day to cipher a message, and it's not like it's any less secure than it used to be. It's not like uh, it's going to be any easier to crack. I mean, on some level it is because, uh, like I mentioned with the substitution cipher, by using uh, some sort of common sense and looking and analyzing patterns and lettering, you can sort of narrow down what an actual plain text message might be based off of the cipher text. But really, if you're trying to brute force a key that's used in a, in a cipher, it's just a matter of how dedicated you are to cracking that key and trying to find out what it is. It's a lot of guessing, a lot of computing power. So we have more computing power now, obviously, but uh, still sometimes it could take you a long time to figure it out. So finally, I just want to close off on the fact that there are other languages out there. Remember that if you're encoding a message, you could use something as simple as Morse code, right? A flashing light, uh, or sometimes it's in text just displayed as periods and dashes. Uh, so, Or you could do it uh, over audio as well. Instead of a flashing light being the Morse code, you could have a series of sounds that distinguish that. So ciphers and encoding and encryption and all that sort of stuff, there's other ways to uh, you know, disguise a message. Uh, and the last example that I have here in this PowerPoint is uh, like the flag, wing, the flag language, the semaphore language. So depending on the way that this guy is holding his flags, that represents different letters. And I mean, even if you wanted to, you know, typically this is a this is like a, a standard, right? This is something that people actually use. Um, but if I wanted to, you could do a substitution cipher of the semaphore language so that C became M and N became F and G became L. You could substitute the flag language to encode your own message that only you knew what it was so that when people 
tried to decode it, they wouldn't end up with a plain text message based off of strictly the default semaphore language. They would have a message that is also now encoded in a substitution cipher. And they might think for a second that they got it wrong. So, uh, anyways, I'm going to stop talking before this gets any longer. Like I said, just kind of like a broad view into uh, forensics. And once again, the main message of the video being pay attention to the language that people use when they're talking about a forensics issue, whether something is encoded, encrypted, or it's uh, a cipher. Make sure that if you're doing research into different types of encoding that you are in fact googling the word encoding methods because sometimes people say, oh, it's encoded. Better start Googling what encryption methods are are available out there. I've seen people do it. I've stood behind people as they make that mistake, and it's tough to watch because uh, <laughs> you know that they're completely headed off in the wrong direction. So uh, be very careful, uh, read carefully, and uh, I think I'll just leave it on that note. So thanks for watching. That's it for this one.